Okay, guys. So, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. If we get going here with our chapter uh, two chemistry, we make sure that's still sharing. Can y'all still see my PowerPoint screen? Yes. Great, great, great. Thank you. All right, so yeah, with chemistry, you know, it's it's really in the reference of how we deal with A and B. It's not the full realm of chemistry that you would normally take in a chemistry class, but we're related to how we see things working in the cell. So we're going to be looking at the components of the cell in, from a chemical biochemical standpoint, and of course, how transport happens. So in order, in order to understand transport through the cell membrane, which is next week's material, we need to really know what uh, an ion is. We, we need to understand what the word polar and nonpolar means, that kind of thing. So in the scope of this chapter, we're gonna be covering ions, we're gonna be covering bonds, we're gonna be covering the properties of water, which means that it, water is a polar molecule. That's a big deal, guys. Water is polar, which means it has both negative and positive charges on it. So it seems to mix with quite a few things, specifically other things that have charges, because as you know, all charges, you know, opposites attract. So if water has both negative and positive charges on it on either side, one side negative, one side positive, they can, it can attract and bind with other molecules that have charges, whether they're negative or positive, right? So water becomes a very social molecule, if you wanna think of it that way, able to blend with any other thing that's polar or any other thing that has a charge. What water does not wanna bond with is anything that doesn't have a charge, things that are nonpolar have no charge, mostly. There's some exceptions, you know, with what we'll see. But nonpolar and nonpolar will be things that have no charge, and those blend together. Polar and nonpolar don't mix, not typically. So that's some of the relationships we need to see. And then we'll finish off talking about some organic compounds and um, some acid base relationships. But to start off with the basic info here uh, that you might have had way back in high school. Uh, solid, liquid, and gas, three forms of matter, of course, in energy, two types, kinetic and potential, kinetic being anything in motion, and potential being anything not in motion, it could be stored energy. There's always the capacity to have chemical, electrical, or mechanical energy, as we see, and then electromagnetic waves, of course, traveling uh, as energy as well. When we look at chemical reactions, we're going to spend some time talking about the the variety of things we can reference here with combination and decomposition reactions. First up, can you realize that with a combination reaction, something is being built up? Built up. So we're building something here with combination. We're taking two smaller subunits and then combining them together to make something bigger. With decomposition, it's the exact opposite. We're taking something bigger and then breaking it down to its smaller subunits. So realize in the scope that we've already covered uh, last week, something of the word, you know, coming from this, the scope of metabolism, if we consider a word like anabolism, I want you guys to know that anabolism is, of course, going to be building up. So the reference is anabolism is a form of combination reaction. Can you appreciate that? And that catabolism, since it's breaking things down, that would be another version of a, a decomposition reaction. So we wanna make these um, associations. Associations are such a big deal to get you to become a better studier, a better test taker. So you wanna associate that combination and anabolism are one and the same. Anabolism represents combination reactions. Combination reactions represent anabolism going on in the cell. Both of them build up, build up to become larger molecules. Decomposition can also be known as a catabolism process or a catabolic process. And just the same catabolism is a decomposition reaction. So backwards and forward, just really saying the same thing two different ways. Another way you can put it 
is uh, some of the terms we covered in lab. You know, we talked about briefly in lab, we've already had it, um, that dehydration synthesis is a form of combination also because dehydration synthesis, that keyword synthesis, means that we're taking two things or more than two things and building them, putting them together to make something bigger. So there's another reference, combination, anabolic, dehydration synthesis, all three associations for the same thing. And there's gonna be one more. Decomposition would be catabolic, like we said, and it would represent hydrolysis, a type of hydrolysis. A hydrolysis would be a type of decomposition reaction because with hydrolysis, we're breaking things down. We take table sugar, we put some water on it and we break it down to the smaller subunits, which would be glucose and fructose. That's what we'll see later on. So decomposition is something, of course, where you break something down. Hydrolysis is just an example or another reference of a decomposition or a catabolic process. That's the glue that you guys need to put together. I find that you know semester after semester, people learn these definitions, but they never actually put it together, right? They never use the information and then apply it somewhere. So that's what you need to learn how to do. Jessica, an example for anabolic would be taking two monosaccharides like glucose and fructose and then combining it to be sucrose. That's an anabolic process because it's, a, it's, it's synthesizing something. It's pull, putting something together. Right, dehydration synthesis is the same thing, yes. So don't be thrown by that term dehydration in that um, when, you, when you say dehydration synthesis, you're talking about synthesizing something. The dehydration just means that in the process of squeezing two atoms together, some water pops out. So I, like I say in my labs, if I squeeze you, which I won't, don't worry. <laughs> you know, think of uh, someone squeezed you when you had to pee, you know, you might pee a little bit, if that helps. That's so inappropriate and so terrible, but sometimes that's what it helps to, uh, to help remember everything. It means you lose water when you synthesize. That's exactly what it means, right? Or think about when you're building something that you sweat. Think about that. Maybe that's an easier, more appropriate example, which, you know, <laughs> I was taught by medical doctors. Uh, and let me tell you, there, and that was a whole different world back then because um, everybody wasn't offended as they are now and so touchy upon every little word. But uh, yeah, they, they, they had many, many inappropriate <laughs> ways of, of sharing knowledge, let me tell you that. But those are the kind of things that sometimes stick. So yeah, when you squeeze two things together, you're gonna have an H and an OH that come off and those H and OH blend together to make water. So we'll, we'll see that later. I'm just trying to get you a, this, these uh, standard reference points. Yeah, synthesis means combination. Combination means anabolism. They're all together. You got it. And what's another thing we could talk about? What do you think? You tell me. Do you think it takes energy to put things together? Like if you were if you were nailing two boards together, does it take energy to do that? Absolutely. It takes energy to put stuff together. Do you think it you think energy is given off when things are broken up? Like when a bomb explodes or when anything explodes, when your, when your pizza explodes in the microwave, when it explodes all over the microwave, the energy that came out of that, right? <laughs> That's decomposition. Yes, so we're gonna see a play on energy here. We're gonna see that we have endergonic and exergonic reactions. Endergonic means energy coming in to build something. Exergonic means energy being released, it's exited somewhere in the process of breaking things down. So there's our fourth reference now. Here we go, ready? <laughs> I told you it always starts simple and then it gets rolling along, all complicated. So combination reactions, if you're making notes of this, this is smart because this is how test questions can get you. A lot of test questions are actually very simple, but you just have to know how to unlock them. So here we go, combination reactions are synthesis reactions which would be a dehydration synthesis. They're also anabolic, right? And they're endergonic. 
So a combination reaction, first of all, is building something up. That's the first thing you need to know. It's also anabolic. It's also known as a synthesis reaction. And it's also, or also could be endergonic, which means you're putting energy in, in order to build something up. If we do the flip of that, decomposition reactions, what's the definition, the simple, the simple definition of decomposition? Breaking down. So that's the first thing. Then we learned that it's catabolic. That's the second thing. Then we learned an example of that could be hydrolysis. That's the third thing. And now what do you think? When you break things down, is energy released? Yeah, when we break up AB in this case, whatever bond is holding together AB, whenever we break that bond, energy is released. Whenever you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you release energy, don't you? Emotions, right? That's energy light waves into the universe. And then that energy, that same energy gets changed and you know, converted into something else and then somebody else falls in love. So there's emotions all over the place. Uh, we, we have to appreciate that everything, everything fits. Let's put it that way. That's a simple way to put it. Standard philosophy, everything fits. Everything has a reason. Just because you don't know the reason doesn't mean that it don't fit. But it always fits. Energy is all over the place. Endergonic means it takes energy put in to a reaction to build it up. Yeah. So here we go right here this is the scary slide right so if we take these uh reactions here and there's a bunch of foreign letters to you right but let's let's play this is this is appropriate studying this is how you should study instead of just reading the definition you want to try something like this let me let me give you an example so i'm gonna black this out right well, let me do it again all right, so if you had something like this on a test, if all you saw was that, right? And it's not algebra, thank God, but we're gonna dissect this. So we're taking two subunits, whatever it might be. We don't know what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. All we know is that we're taking X plus Y and making X, Y. Two smaller units put together, right? This would have to be something of a synthesis reaction, wouldn't it? Would it also be anabolic? Yes, it would be, right? Now, in this case, we're putting energy in. That's what that PI is. It's an inorganic phosphate. That's a little nugget of energy in, in the, inside the cell that we'll learn later on. So it takes energy to squeeze X and Y together. So that's the energy being put in the reaction. So anything, if you, if you just receive something like this on a test, at least you know that it's anabolic, synthesis, endergonic, right? And that you're building up something. That's the whole point. Just being able to recognize what's going on. And then another example, of the same thing is this right here. We have no idea possibly what ADP and PI is. All you gotta know, right? Just know how to know what you know. You just gotta know something's being built up. This stands for adenosine diphosphate. When we add another loose phosphate to it, we get adenosine triphosphate. So just one of the many examples and one of the many, many millions of times per second that this happening in your cell right now, all over the body, ATP is an energy molecule that's being built up and broken down all day long. Just as soon as it's built up, guess what happens? That ATP is broken down, right? And there's your little packet of energy right there. Then another ADP picks up on another ADP PI and then makes another ATP. So it's a complete, what we call a redundancy. It's a cycle that happens all day, all night, your entire life until you die. And then you stop producing ATP. Therefore, it can't be broken down anymore or built up anymore. So there you go. This is a window into what metabolism looks like. This is why the same thing, you know, I get a little philosophical at times. That's just to, um, to show you some com comparisons uh, in the world around you. But this is why this should tell you, this should tell you the basic logic of life. You can learn so much logic from science. It's amazing. 
Well, except for science nowadays, when it comes to COVID, that, that stuff doesn't make any sense a lot of times. <laughs> well, that's another story we'll, we'll talk about another time. COVID's a nasty little bug, but the science that's being presented with it is not always uh, as it has been, let's just say, for the last you know several hundred years. But anyway, <laughs> uh, here you go. So recognize that everything is being built up and broken down all the time. All the time, all the time, all the time. And that's how it should be. We can't expect in our life for things to always be built up. We have to somehow expect or at least deal with things breaking down so we can build up again. So when someone breaks you down, when someone insults you, that only proves your worth. That only proves if you're willing to stand up for yourself and build yourself up stronger. So you change the way people see you. Sometimes people may see you as weak, so they treat you as a weakling. And then you get offended by that. And then you have a choice. Do I choose to stand up to it and prove who I am? Or do I choose to be a victim? So everything is to build you up. Even the worst things in life are there to build you up in some way. Even if you don't understand it, the truth of it is, it's there to build you up. Because it's all represented in basic science. Another one is um, this oxidation reduction reaction here. We don't really play with these that much in a &P one You might see this. Yes, Keisha, yes. You might see this in AMP2, but all you got to know is the definition. We're not really going to throw any examples of this at you. Just understand we add a hydrogen at the end here. That actually means it's reduced. <laughs> it's kind of backwards you think of it that way. If the hydrogen is removed at the end, right, then it's oxidized if it's lost at the end of the reaction. And then hydrogen will go somewhere else. All right, anyway, don't worry so much about those. This is the grand scheme. Know these definitions, guys. Because what we're talking about is the balance of anabolism, the balance of building up and breaking down catabolism here gives you overall metabolism. And we've come full circle. That's what we talked about last, last lecture. You know, we talked about metabolism being all the reactions that happen inside the cell, which means all over the body. And it's just a constant redundancy of building things up, breaking things down over and over and over again. You eat food, your body breaks it down to the smallest of subunits. It's so small that it has to go right through the blood vessel walls, literally. Guys, you know what blood vessels look like, right? They, look, they appear to be solid, but you gotta know there's microscopic holes in those suckers. You can't see them, but the nutrients, these micronutrients that we get out of all the food that we eat, they pass right through the walls of the blood vessels, right through the walls of the intestines, right? And that's how you absorb nutrients. So if they're never broken down to that size, you won't be able to absorb them. And this is part of the reason some people have some malabsorption issues, you know, with, uh, with different toxins in their life or a variety of medications can accumulate in your gut and you're unable to absorb the nutrients that you need. This is what happens all the time with elderly. Uh, it's a shame because they're, you know, some elderly are, you know, they have to take all these medicines week after week, but yet over 20 years time taking 10 medications a day, there's going to be some buildup of some, you know, not so great stuff in the intestines, which can block absorption of nutrients. So therefore, they're only breaking part of the food down, right? Only absorbing part of those nutrients. Therefore, their cells are lacking anabolic activity. Their cells are not able to produce all the necessary compounds to build future healthy cells, and they end up getting disease processes. So it really does start at this level. Yeah, um, Savannah, that's it. Metabolism is the combination of both of this going on. Absolutely. So here you go. Here's the word association. Energy releasing exergonic is going to be catabolism. It's going to be decomposition. So practice writing this out to make sure you know those associations that we just did. Anabolism is endergonic. It's going to be a synthesis reaction. It requires energy input. So it's like chasing your tail, guys. Just be able to do the game. Do the dance. Reference those words together. And you can't have one without the other. We can't have happy without sad, sad without happy in life. It's got to be both. 
<laughs> that's how it goes. You can't get around it. That's how all life is built. Um, anyway, here's another view of, from your book, how synthesis reactions may look. If we take small subunits like amino acids and we want to build them together, there we go. We synthesize and group those together, making bonds to make a bigger molecule, which in this case would be a protein. And that could be reversed. If proteins break down, go in the other direction, they're going to break down to become amino acids. All proteins, all proteins break down to become amino acids. That's it. Amino acids will assemble themselves in random amounts of ways to build proteins. So yeah, um, when it comes to some of these COVID vaccines, uh, they figured out a way to build a certain spike. Well, actually, I mean, the honesty of it is they figured out a way to, um, to have the messenger RNA, which is just a group of these amino acids, a certain gr a select group of amino acids of mRNA, then they eject the mRNA into your body and your body produces the, the, the viral protein. So that's some of the, you know, that's some of the controversy there. Um, and it's, it's worthy to talk about. Uh, you build the viral protein, your body builds that viral protein on its own. So the, the, the controversy is, is the vaccine actually a vaccine more so than it is a medication because you're not actually inoculating the person with the virus which would be a traditional vaccine, you're inoculating someone with messenger RNA. And then the body, your body produces the viral RNA, right? The viral protein, I should say. Uh, then your immune system attacks that viral protein. So that's the thing. It's, it's amazing science and obviously it works, but also obviously sometimes it doesn't work. So that's where the controversy comes from. Um, you know, some scientists don't agree with the fact that you're, that our bodies should be producing viral proteins. Some scientists believe that's very dangerous that we would build viral proteins, but that's what's going on with the vaccines. Um, and you know, what can I say? Uh, you can have your own opinion on that, but that's some of the controversy behind it. Let me see the question here. Yes, yes, that's true. The anabolics, right, are definitely useful in that way. Absolutely. And uh, like anything, um, anytime we do this to kind of bully the cell in one direction, like what you're talking about, Antoinette, it's always useful in the, in the proper way. But if it's taken too far, it can override that cell and then disease can come around. Yeah. So when it comes to steroids, steroids work like a charm. They're beautiful, beautiful therapy. Wonderful, actually. But moderation if you go too far with steroids then you really screw things up because you start messing with feedback loops uh, in the cell which means if you override the cell too much then the cell is going to say hey i guess i'm not needed anymore right <laughs> so then the cell stops doing all those biofeedback systems and then then you're really in trouble when you've taken steroids too far all right, another example of decomposition here, building, uh, having something big and breaking it down there. We'll see this time and time again. This is another relationship we see in the body in, in AMP2. No reason to be so concerned about this now. This is just an example of how reactions can be reversed. We can balance, this is carbonic acid, a very, very highly used buffer in the respiratory system that you'll learn in AMP2. It just goes to show that if we have too much CO2 in the blood, it can match it with water to be bicarb uh, carbonic acid. Or if we have too many hydrogen ions, right? It can match it with bicarbonate here to become carbonic acid, which is more neutral. So whatever the case is, right? The kidney and the lungs, you breathing differently or the kidney absorbing or releasing hydrogen ions differently can manage these acid-base relationships in your blood with these amazingly beautiful reactions. It's just truly humbling, guys. The more and more you learn about the body, you think, wow. I mean, I'm still wild every day, every single day at, at the beauty of physiology uh, that we've got inside of us. And for me, at least in my practice, I like to uh, you know, celebrate that. When a patient comes to me that's having some problems, I don't just think about their problems. I think about how great their physiology is, we just need to correct uh, some of the miscommunication there. 
rather than seeing them as a diseased human, that's not going to be, that's not going to facilitate healing. <laughs> Facilitating healing means to celebrate what's already correct and just correcting what needs to be corrected. <laughs> so yeah, that's just another example of equilibrium that we'll see. Here's some good test question stuff, guys. Uh, how do you increase the rate of a reaction? This is high school stuff, really. We can increase the temperature, which makes things go quicker. You know, heat always speeds things up, doesn't it? A smaller particle size just means that it'll happen faster with a smaller particle. Higher concentrations of that particle will make it go faster as well. So imagine this being a multiple choice question and you wanna select all the above, don't you? Which of the following statements will increase the rate of a chemical reaction? There's the question, which I don't even know if that's, that's worded that way on the test or not, but this question has been around for hundreds of years. So it's gonna be something similar. Which of the following statements will increase the rate of chemical reaction? Temperature, bam, particle size being smaller, yes. Higher concentration, yes, all the above. Or it could say which one of these statements is not going to change the rate or increase the rate of chemical reaction? Which one would not? It would be something like a larger particle or a lower temperature. When they flip the words around, that's when you start talking about the, the negative side of things. So this is the norm right here, a higher temperature, a smaller particle and a higher concentration. All these will increase the rate. Anything different than that, anything opposite of that will decrease the rate. And then lastly, a catalyst. Catalysts are always there to speed things up, but they're not used up themselves. So they, they influence the reaction, but they're not used in the reaction. They're just there like on the sidelines, like a coach making the play happen but they're not used in the play. So this would be an example of like an enzyme. That's what enzymes do. Enzymes are catalysts to increase the rate of the reaction. But this one has been a test question all of its own. Please be sure you have highlighted catalysts. They increase the rate without being used in the reaction. Therefore, they are not changed. They can go on and influence another reaction, right? They're not used up in the reaction. Catalysts are cool like that. All right, so here we are at the basis of what everything is made in the body. So look at this, 96% of our human body of what we're physically made of is these right here. These four elements make up basically your entire cell, which means they make up your almost your entire body. The other three to 4% is just gonna be all the things that make it work better. Things like sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, all those type of elements are the ones that make it work physiologically. This is the hardware. This is what your tissues are made of or your cells are made of. All the other stuff I just mentioned, the sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, all that stuff, that is what helps the body work like it should. That's what helps cells communicate with each other. That's what helps drive water around the body, you know? So yeah, know that one. I paused here for a reason. Know this section, 96%. <laughs> These four elements, C-H-O-N, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Notice, notice calcium is not there, right? It's just these four for 96%. Okay. Now we get into some variances. If we come up to 98.5%, look, now we can include calcium phosphorus, but again, these first four are the primary ones that you need to focus on. Did y'all get that? Right there. <laughs> And how about this one? Again, one more time. What does a catalyst do? Increases the rate without being used up. Great. Which of the following will increase the rate of a reaction? 
higher temp, smaller particle, higher concentration. All very, very basic test questions being thrown at you. Cool. All right, then we come to this, our favorite part. Who loves the periodic table? Anybody get special like tingly feelings or does it make you want to vomit? Which, which one? <laughs> yep, I hear you. Well, the good news, we don't have to memorize anything of the data on his chart. You'll always be given, <laughs> looks like that's a pretty, uh, pretty across the board, yep. Wow. So we don't, we all agree that the periodic table makes us feel nauseous, right? Okay, that's fine. Well, let's deal with what we can deal with. Let's check it out. Notice how it's organized, right? We got hydrogen over here with the number one above it. And over here, we got helium with number two above it. Then lithium with three, beryllium four, so on and so on and so on. So we're talking about it going horizontally. Well, it's arranged this way for a reason. Uh, hydrogen, it's not like it's number one because it was the first thing that was discovered. Well, it is the most abundant, that's for sure. Um, it is the most abundant gas of all. You know, a good, a good 75% of the entire universe, we're talking the whole sucker, the whole thing that we know of is hydrogen. Another 24% about, about that is helium. So roughly 99% of our entire universe is hydrogen and helium. And then all this other stuff, uh, all these other elements. Uh, yeah, that takes us uh, <laughs> covering the other 1%. So yeah, the sun is hydrogen and helium. So guess what, guys? Hydrogen represents a whole crap load of energy. So when you eat when you eat that little cinnamon roll or that pop tart or whatever it is you grab at the gas station in that package, <laughs> if it says partially hydrogenated on the back, you better know you're eating like a bomb of energy. Hydrogen is very abundant, represents lots and lots of potential energy when it's combined with other things. So here we go. It's number one because it has one proton in its nucleus. So when we look at these elements, the, the building block of each element is the atom. The hydrogen atom has one proton in its nucleus. The helium atom has two protons in its nucleus. Carbon will have six, oxygen will have eight. So what we're really looking at, this number above each of these elements represents what's called the atomic number. Basically that's its ID, right? If it were a football player, it'd, it'd be the jersey number, right? So yes, hydrogen has one, lithium has three, sodium has 11. These are all the count of protein, or excuse me, protons in their nucleus, not protein. So 11 protons in the sodium nucleus, 12 protons in the magnesium nucleus, 20 protons in the calcium nucleus of the atom. So once more, the atomic number equals the proton number. So please know that. I'm going to put it in chat. Atomic number equals proton number. Therefore, see, that's the definition, guys, but you got to know how to apply it. If I give you a test question saying that atom, you know, atom X, whatever we want to call it, doesn't matter what it is, has 55 protons. Then I ask, what is the atomic number? You tell me. 55, right? Now, if I flip the table and I say, okay, this whatever atom has an atomic number of 55, what's how many protons does it have in its nucleus? 55 again, yep, it's one and the same. Now we can go an extra step and say, okay, if the atomic number is 24, then how many electrons are there? And the twist is, if you know the proton number, then you know the electron number because it's the same thing. So if we look at chromium, chromium has an atomic number of 24, which means it has 24 protons in its atomic nucleus. And the same amount of electrons must be there, which is 24. 
So by you knowing the atomic number, it gives you the proton number and it also gives you the electron number indirectly. So once more, let's pick on calcium, 20, 20 protons in calcium. That means it has an atomic number of 20. Well, how many electrons are there? 20. <laughs> so it's not like it's hard math. It's there, right there in front of you. The difference is if you get a question stating, okay, let's pick on sodium for a second. Sodium has an atomic number of 11. Therefore, there are 11 protons and 11 electrons, yes. But what happens if the question went one step further and it stated, but this atom lost an electron, then how many would it have? If sodium lost an electron, how many would it have? one electron, then it would have 10, right? And the fact that it would lose negativity, which is electrons are always negative, the fact that sodium loses an electron, and since electrons are negative, that means we're losing negativity, which means we're more positive. So sodium would be known as a cation. So that's what we're gonna see in lab. Sodium is a famous cation because when it binds with chlorine, it becomes a cation that can be used all around the body. Okay, so we'll get there. That was just a little heads up, more, more to come. Here's the anatomy of our atom. We've got two protons and two neutrons in this nucleus specifically. So the fact that we're looking at an atom of two protons, what atom must that be? Which one has two right here? Helium. There we go. So now we know where we are. We're looking at an atom of helium right here. Does it have two electrons? Yes, it does. Because in a stable state, which means when it's not reacting with something else, the protons will always equal electrons. Therefore, if I gave you a question, the atomic number is two. You could tell me how many proton protons it is, right? which is two. You could tell me how many electrons there are, right? Which also be two. The next thing we need to talk about is neutrons. Neutrons are neutral. They don't always match the same number as the proton, like an electron would. They're just there making up part of the mass of the nucleus. So when we talk about mass, that means what is in the nucleus. You tell me, how many particles are in that nucleus right now? Four. So that means that would be the atomic mass. So what's the atomic mass of helium? Four. Perfect. Whoops. Oh, shoot. I didn't mean to click on that. And what do we see right here? We see 4.000 blank blank, and it's got some other numbers behind it. So we're gonna talk about why it's not just an even four. Yeah, I can repeat it. What I was saying was, if we're looking at this nucleus of this atom, all we have to do is count the particles to give us the overall mass because the mass is represented as adding up the protons plus the neutrons. We don't consider electrons in the mass because they have an insignificant mass. I so we only question. count the nucleus. So the atomic mass of this atom is four. What's the atomic number? Anybody remember? Two. Two, because it's two protons, right? So now, that's, go ahead. I'm sorry. So is it four because there's four dots? Because mm -hmm. there's two uh, neutrons and two protons, and that's how we got four? Perfect. Yep. Okay. Yep. Because we only consider the nucleus when we, when we talk about the mass. So whatever's in the nucleus, you know, whatever's there. That's, you count them up and that's what the mass is. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, 
are individual atoms either positive or negative without electron exchange? No, they're neutral. Okay. Thank Everything you. on the periodic table will be, will be non-reactive um, when it's on its own. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So if you wanna click on that chart, you get something like this and you could change the temperature and see how they change in reactivity. So don't you love that? Yeah, don't you love chemistry? <laughs> okay, so moving on, here's our big, our big data right here. Protons are positive. They're found in the nucleus. And they give us what's called the atomic number. So if I tell you that the atomic number of hydrogen is one, it means it has one proton. If the atomic number of carbon is six, which it is on the periodic table, then it just means it's simply identifying that carbon has six protons. So think of the atomic number as an ID. No other atom or element can have the same atomic number. That's it. Hydrogen is the only one with number one. Oxygen is the only element with eight protons, right? Nothing else can have eight protons except oxygen. That's it. The one exception to that is when we start talking about isotopes. Like if you had a twin of yourself or a cousin, or not a cousin, a clone is what I meant to say, a clone of yourself and look at identical, but you happen to wear a different shirt, then you're the same person if it's a, if it's a true clone, but you just have a little bit something different about you. So that's what we're gonna talk about is was what an isotope is. Isotopes are made from neutrons being different in the atom. Neutrons have no charge. They're found in the nucleus with the protons, yes. They give us the overall mass. But when we have different a different, the same element with different number of neutrons, it's called an isotope. So let me go here for a second, then I'll come back. Here's hydrogen in its normal state as it's found in nature. But the more they dug around, they also found other versions of hydrogen. Check it out. These two other versions of hydrogen are going to be known as isotopes of hydrogen. Now, how do we know they're still hydrogen, by the way? Because they still have only one proton. So that must be hydrogen. But check it out. They have different numbers of neutrons. So that's what makes them an isotope. Iso means same. In this case, they're the same atom, but just different versions of it. One version has one neutron, another version has two neutrons. So what's the atomic mass of the normal version? What's the mass here? Number, yeah, it's one, because it's just one particle. The mass of this version is two. The mass of that version would be three. So most, a good 99% of all hydrogen in the universe is going to be this, and very scant amounts of these found in nature. So when you average up all possibilities of the isotopes, you get a number like this. For hydrogen, it would normally be number, it would normally be one, right? But check out what number it is. It says 1.00794. So that 794 at the end, it's just accounting for other isotopes that have neutrons, which may change the uh, average of the mass. You know what I mean? So that's what's known as the atomic weight. This is the most difficult thing probably in this whole darn chapter is understanding what atomic weight is. Whoops, right there. The average of all the mass numbers is the atomic weight. The average of all mass numbers means atomic weight. Yeah. So it's not like you're going to see a lot of examples of that, but just um, you know, understand that that's just an average of all isotopes, basically, the atomic weight. You won't be asked to calculate anything. Just have to understand the definition. I actually don't know what the, uh, the suffix tope is referring to in that case. I don't know specifically, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, that could be, that could be it, yeah. All right, so these are the three you need to work on. So consider it if you've got, you know, a 10 or 15 minute study goal, you got some time to look at it, master these. Know the definitions and know how to apply them. So here's an example right here. If you get something like this, where it's giving you all the information you need, you just need to figure out a little bit more. Here's carbon. Its atomic number is six. So here you go. Here's some test questions. You get carbon with an atomic number of six. Therefore, how many protons does it have? Six. Now it's telling you a mass number, which is the same as the atomic mass of 14. So if the mass number is protons plus neutrons, look at the screen right here, and you know there's six protons, if there's six protons and together is 14, how many neutrons would we have? Eight, you got it. So some simple subtraction. You take the smaller number, which is the proton number, you subtract it from the big number, which is both protons and neutrons, and you're left over with eight, which would give you the neutron number. You got it. That's the most difficult math we're gonna have. That's it. That is it. Now, how many electrons do we have in this, in this uh, example? We have six electrons. You got it, because the electron is going to match the same as the proton number. You got it. The only time that changes is if carbon chooses to react with something or any other element, right? So in a stable state on the periodic table, they're all neutral. They're all non-reactive in a case. No charges for any of these overall if they're not reacting. Once they start reacting with other things, there's charges. Yeah, or there, there can be charges. All right, so I think, uh, yeah, for this little statement up here, when those isotopes are decayed off, that's what they're called radioactive. So when, when, um, when neutrons kind of flake off, they release radioactivity. That's what that means. So I think everything was there. Yeah, electrons are gonna be negative, always found in these energy levels. Now note, we're gonna cover this real quickly. And the first two energy levels, you can have a max of two electrons in the first one and a max of eight electrons in the next shell or the next energy level. So that's the, that's the extent we need to learn that one. So if we go to this example right here, look at these energy levels, check it out. Is the first energy level, is it full? Yes or no? The first one's gonna be the smallest one, closest to the nucleus. Yes, could you, you could get a question just like that. You'll get a group of uh, atoms here and it's gonna ask which one has a full first energy level. So all these are full. What about which one of these has a full second energy level? The sodium atom has a full second energy level, doesn't it? with eight. What about nitrogen? How many does it have in its outer shell? Second shell. It has seven. What about this one? Carbon only has four. So only sodium has a full second shell. So we need to learn those first two shells for sure. The first one has a max of two electrons. The second shell has a max of eight. So just recognize what it means to have a full first or second shell of electron. Now, whatever the atom, it doesn't matter the size, the outer shell, the most outer shell is gonna be called the valence shell. So how many valence electrons does sodium have? That outer shell, just the one. How many valence electrons does nitrogen have? One, two, three, four, five. Beautiful. Now you know about valence. Another test question. So you just add them all up, guys. Here we go. Protons are positive. Where are they found? Nucleus. Test question. What do they give us? 
They give us the atomic number, another test question, which also gives us the electron number as well. Neutrons are neutral. Where are they found? They're found in the nucleus. They help make up the mass, right? So the protons plus neutron give us the mass, the atomic mass or the mass number. Neutrons also give us isotopes. So see the word association, neutrons, isotopes, mass, right? Nucleus, three words. Instead of studying everything in a definition form, try to get focused and learn just the keywords. All right. Now that brings us to our discussion about ions. It's the same stuff you'll be doing in lab. If an atom gains or loses an electron by interacting with something else, it's not just going to gain or lose on its own. This means when it chooses to interact with another atom, it could lose an electron or gain the electron because it's only the electrons that move around when they react with other things. So if an atom happens to lose an electron, it becomes what's called a cation. This becomes a positively charged ion because it lost negativity. And of course, a cation will naturally attract an anion, which is going to be negative. Why are anions negative? Because they have gained another electron. So this is what we're going to see with sodium and chlorine in lab. Sodium becomes the cation because it loses its electron right here. Whoops. In a neutral state on the periodic table, ball, all on its own, it has even Steven numbers, doesn't it? But if it loses an electron by interacting with chlorine, sodium now becomes what's called a cation because it has a positive charge after it lost an electron. And chlorine becomes the anion because it gained the extra electron. It basically stole it from sodium. So it's going to show off it has an extra negative charge. This is not a minus sign. This is a negative charge. So that's what it means when you get an ionic bond. This is where we're going to stop today on these three bonds. But uh, in lab, you should be learning each of these three bonds. An ionic bond. Let me go ahead and go to the definition. We'll come back uh, next time. Ionic bond will be a transfer, which is a gain or a loss. When you gain or lose electrons, that's a bond known as an ionic bond. Because in order to make any bond, electrons have to move around, never the protons. It's always electrons. And it's always specifically the valence electrons, the outer shell, that will participate in bonding. So if the electron is lost, there it goes. It's over there now or this one gained, it's an ionic bond. If the electrons are shared, which means they can go back and forth from one atom to the other, it's a covalent bond. And then a weaker attraction would be a hydrogen bond between oxygen and hydrogen that you'll see in lab. So we will end there today, guys. Uh, we'll pick up and cover the rest of this on Friday, but this should uh, get you well started in, uh, into lab and you'll take this a little further. Let me know if you have any questions, otherwise we are done for today.